So this is just a brief idea about how it works. So we have two transport equations for k and for epsilon and they are related to, to each other. I mean this is not having the steady state, the transient term here. It's a steady state equation and we have the uh, terms on the right hand side, the diffusion and the source terms. Uh, there are some modeling constants like C2 and C mu and ultimately this viscosity, eddy viscosity is expressed in terms of k and epsilon. Once you calculate this in each and every cell, we express mu t in terms of k and epsilon and some modeling constants like C mu. These are all accessible on the fluent GUI on the turbulence modeling option on the turbulence modeling panel. There are some problems though with the standard K-epsilon model why we need to move on to the RNG unrealizable variants of K-epsilon. One of the problems which is encountered is in such flows where there is there can be flow separation. Now if the flow is completely uniform, there is no separation, this is not such a problem. K-epsilon standard can work very well. It's computationally quite cheap and um, fair enough accurate and uh, it's, it works very well for highly turbulent flows. So K-epsilon is basically meant for highly turbulent isotropic turbulent flows. But when it has to deal with such curvilinear structures as this one, there's, where there is no, no such velocity profile, what you will see here is a flow separation. So what happens as a result is that there's a reverse flow occurring here because of which there is a, a flow separation and in such cases such predicting such separations or swirling flows or with such strong streamlined curvatures the K-epsilon standard model fails and therefore the RNG and realizable variants come to the rescue. RNG and realizable can take care of a variable uh, viscosity, eddy viscosity inside the domain. So this is helpful but there are better options also available in terms of the other model which is, which is called the K-omega model. The K omega model is actually meant for low turbulent flows. So it is one of the advantages of K omega that it can do a very good treatment of turbulence uh, prediction near the walls because it's near the walls because of no slip boundary condition often the flow is stagnant and from there the free stream turbulence uh, occurs into the domain. So the free stream turbulence you can have the high Reynolds number flow there K epsilon might work very well but K omega can work much better near the wall. So therefore this is such a prediction of in terms of Y plus that for K epsilon model you need a very fine mesh compared to a K omega model. I'll speak about Y plus in some time but in industrial flows we have to have a model which can work very well without such a very fine mesh resolution near the walls. So K epsilon has some problems uh, especially for predicting low turbulent flows so K omega comes to the rescue and the standard Wilcox formulation of uh, K omega is the following that it solves a K equation and an omega equation and the eddy viscosity is then evaluated in each and every cell after K and omega are obtained in each and every cell in terms of the density and K and omega. It's a very simple algebraic equation. The shear stress transport which is a variant of K omega called the K omega SST model it combines the advantages and um, advantages of both K omega and K epsilon. So it uses K omega in those regions where it should um, encounter a low turbulent flow to predict separation very well and where it can afford to apply the K epsilon model in the free stream where the turbulence is quite high, there it applies the K epsilon model. So it's very useful to see how it can shift between the K epsilon and K omega. This is the shear stress transport model or K omega SST as it is called in ANSYS fluent terminology. So K epsilon may fail to predict the separation but K omega SST does it quite well. Let's understand how the separation uh, flows uh, work but uh, how this K omega SST works is uh, that it combines the benefits of K omega and K epsilon through a blending factor. So this blending factor when, when it becomes zero which is near the walls it uh, behaves like a K omega equation model and if this blending factor F1 is equal to 1 or close to 1, it's behaving more or less like a K-epsilon model that's in the free stream. So it's a very uh, nice way which has been proposed by uh, mentor, uh, Florian Mentor, Dr. Florian Mentor from ANSYS CFX um, earlier and now it's um, complete, it's part of ANSYS research group in Otterfing in Munich, near Munich in Germany. There is a dedicated team working on turbulence modeling to be included into ANSYS CFD products. So this was his proposal, this uh, uh, K omega SST turbulence model. The separation 
uh, physics works in the following way that first of all let's say the flow is coming in and there is an incoming boundary layer because of an adverse pressure gradient because of a pressure gradient which opposes the direction of the flow there can be such flow separation as you can see here and uh, if there's a favorable pressure gradient that is the pressure gradient is uh, favoring the flow of the fluid so it is it means in the direction of the flow the pressure is reducing in that case you get reattachment of the flow so this is a favorable pressure gradient here the pressure gradient is uh, such a way that the pressure is actually in, uh, increasing downstream so therefore there is a flow separation and uh, the turbulence models which they pr which produce high shear stresses because ultimately we are trying to analyze the shear stresses because we are operating under the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. So these shear stresses, if they are over-predicted, then the adverse pressure gradient effects are completely missed. So they can't really um, they can't really predict the flow separation which occurs because of adverse pressure gradient because they um, over-predict the shear stresses because of their inherent nature. So therefore, K epsilon standard does not um, uh, fit well for capturing such physics like flow separation. If you want to go for um, a very good uh, physics prediction of flow separation, secondary flows, then you have to go for one of the K epsilon RNG or realizable variants or to go for K omega SST. Also let's have a look at what happens near the wall. As I mentioned to you, near the wall the flow is more or less stagnant and that's where uh, most of the um, boundary layer behavior is uh, very interesting to note and the near wall treatment is especially important if we are uh, trying to predict very accurately what happens, what is the shear stresses, what is the heat transfer coefficient. In such cases the near wall treatment is an important part um, and we have to capture it very well. We have to do a very good modeling for them. So the no slip boundary condition, it often means that, the, uh, that near the wall uh, there is a completely different behavior compared to the free stream. So there is a boundary layer region and basically this near wall region is divided into two categories, the inner layer region and the outer layer region. In the inner layer region is the major problem with the turbulence models that they can't really predict it so well. They can't predict the turbulence phenomena within this inner layer. So this inner layer is further classified into three uh, three layers. It's called the viscous sublayer, which is just adjacent to the wall the flow here is more or less laminar and there is a good theory available for predicting the flow phenomena inside this. There is another layer called the buffer layer which is a dangerous area. The theory is not well developed and therefore we have to be afraid of having our uh, calculation point within this buffer layer. There is another log law layer where the theory is again well established in terms of wall functions. So basically what we are trying to achieve is that if we are trying to predict the near wall treatment we have to make sure that our calculation point of the first cell is lying either in the viscous sublayer where the theory is well established or in the log law layer. So we'll have a look at it how exactly this modeling can be done for the near wall treatment. The motivation for accurate near wall treatment is that we can have good prediction of wall shear stresses for exact calculation of drag because overall we are doing a turbulence modeling it's not a direct numerical simulation therefore we need to have accurate prediction of wall shear stresses for drag calculations as well as efficient uh, heat transfer calculations that we are also looking for. So overall as far as near wall treatment is concerned the theory shows this following graph which you will often find in near wall treatment uh, literature. So what they predict is that we have uh, the viscous sublayer region which is be, uh, within uh, something called y plus 5. Now what is y plus um, is the following that y plus is actually a dimensionless number it's um, uh, a, a special kind of Reynolds number in terms of something called the wall uh, velocity or wall uh, turbulent velocity which is uh, calculated in this way it's equal to under root of the shear stress divided by the density at the wall so this is how this wall uh, turbulent velocity is calculated and in terms of this the y represents the calculation points location with respect to the wall so you have a dimensionless number of the form of the Reynolds number which is called y plus and you also define u plus as the velocity at that calculation point divided by this uh, velocity that you have u star. So 
uh, there is a viscous sublayer region where u plus is equal to y plus so this is what uh, follows so in that case this viscous sublayer there's a very good theory the dangerous area is within this 5 to 60 area which is the buffer layer and we try to have our calculation point that is the first cell height either less than this or beyond this we try to avoid being in this buffer layer area so let's say we uh, have it above this so this in if it is above this uh, area this is y plus more than 60 in that case we are safe because we are operating in the log law layer and there is good enough theory available also for this so in usual CFD this is an iterative process we do a simulation we learn from the practices what is the situation what is the y plus criteria if you are meeting the y plus criteria or not and accordingly we adjust the mesh let's say we do a simulation and we find out that there is some region in which y plus is less than 5 and other region it is y plus greater than uh, 5 then in that case we try to ensure that all the first cell height is such we try to refine the mesh so that we get everywhere within y plus 5 but this is often uh, something which reflects in terms of the cell count which increases drastically therefore we try to go for a coarser mesh that is everywhere the cell size should be such the first cell height should be such that the y plus is beyond 60 in that case we are safe if it is lying between 5 and 60 we have to consider remeshing either making it finer or to make it coarser so this is the overall um, principle by which we can do CFD simulations. The basic motivation for accurate near wall treatment is to predict appropriate values of wall shear stresses to calculate drag forces and pressure drop values and also to have accurate prediction of heat transfer coefficient and heat transfer phenomena. As a general guide we can have a look at the RANS family of uh, turbulence models. So the general uh, guideline for ANSYS fluent is the following that we try to have use k epsilon RNG class of models with the appropriate y plus dependent near wall treatment which I already just showed you that if we have y plus less than 5 then we try to have uh, actual prediction so we use something called the enhanced wall treatment which is there on the fluent GUI and if y plus is beyond 60 then we use the wall function approach which is a good enough prediction of the log law layer so we try to operate in these two regimes and we do use k epsilon RNG if you are using ANSYS fluent in ANSYS CFX they, it has an inbuilt model by which it can switch between the wall function approach and the near wall enhanced treatment so k omega SST is what they suggest for ANSYS CFX and automatically you should ensure that your mesh is either beyond uh, such that the y plus is beyond 60 or less than 5 everywhere in the domain as a general guideline for high turbulent flows that is beyond Reynolds number 50,000 for internal flows for example we can expect that the flow separation will be very minimum and in that case k epsilon standard can be used k epsilon RNG or realizable can be used for better prediction if there is flow separation also taking place the low turbulent flows where we are operating just the turbulence has uh, started and it is uh, less than the high turbulent regime for internal flows it's 50,000 then we can use k omega SST but we can use a combination of standard k omega and k epsilon models if, if there is a transition between low turbulence and high turbulence with expected flow separation zones can be predicted quite accurately with this SST model if the flow is highly swirling we usually go for the RSM that is the Reynolds stress models which does not assume an isotropic eddy viscosity and the k epsilon RNG with swirl dominated option is also available in ANSYS fluent for predicting highly swirling flows with reduced computational effort because the Reynolds stress model RSM model is computationally very expensive so we have to uh, see where we can actually uh, have a trade-off with computational expense and feasibility and accurate predictions the compressible external flows usually have the general practice of using the spallart almoraz one equation model because it can um, fairly, fairly well enough predict the adverse pressure gradients and the shock waves which are generated uh, with not so great computational effort so this is the general guideline that we can follow for the RANS family now let's move on to the space averaging approaches basically when I'm dealing with uh, space averaging approach as I mentioned already we are dealing with large eddy simulations or detached eddy simulations which is a combination of the large eddy simulation and time averaging approach but we are fairly dealing with unsteady flows because if we want to actually capture the larger eddies we have to assume we have to count with this the turbulence being an unsteady phenomena we cannot imagine a steady state LES 
turbulence model or steady state DES turbulence simulation. So we have to go for an unsteady uh, flow simulation. But there are also other means of doing unsteady flow uh, turbulence modeling. So one of them is called the URANS, which is the unsteady RANS approach, which is actually does not really make sense because RANS is based on time averaging concept. And if I'm using the time averaging concept, concept for predicting an unsteady phenomena, then I have to ensure that my time step uh, within my time step, the time averaging should be reached for my different equations, which is not always the case. So therefore, we have other options like the large eddy simulation or the detached eddy simulation. And something which has uh, recently been included into ANSYS Fluent R release 13, uh, it was already there in CFX, is the scale adaptive simulation, which is which offers a cheap substitute, a much cheaper substitute to the very expensive LES or DES uh, turbulence models of predicting the eddies. So we'll have a look at them one by one. So URANS, as I mentioned to you, it's actually not making any physical sense, but the requirement, it can be used for predicting some kind of unsteady flows, predicting turbulence within unsteady flows. Uh, it requires um, that you should use it only for such situations when there is a separation of scales. So between the resolved and unresolved st structures, there should be a clear separation of the frequencies of the scales. This is typically encountered in, um, let's say, a dam breakup problem or slowly oscillating airfoil. In such cases, we can imagine using the URANS approach. Um, by the way, in uh, real industrial problems, they often use the URANS approach, but we have to be aware of the physical uh, limitations of this. Therefore, what comes into our re rescue is the large eddy simulation. It actually resolves the larger eddies, but it models the smaller eddies because it is not going to uh, capture all the eddies because the smaller eddies are quite high and we can see some numbers here that actually for direct numerical simulations we might need a much higher cell count but we can do very well enough with a large eddy simulation based approach where we can reduce the cell count and we can just capture the larger eddies the smaller eddies we can live with and usually this is very helpful for predicting unsteady forces or also for noise prediction this is large eddy simulation is typically what is uh, employed for flow induced noise generation of flow in induced uh, structural deformations so for fluid structure interactions this is a very good option to be considered for um, predicting uh, l the larger eddies at least that we can have some prediction of the structural um, effects on the because of the fluid so LES is suitable for the free shear flows um, but only in the free stream. Near the walls, LES also has problems. So LES is not suitable for high Reynolds boundary layer problems. So whenever near the walls, LES does not perform very well. So we have a mixing again, a blending uh, function for it, uh, the, which is called the, uh, the detached eddy simulation. I'll speak about this in the next slide, but just have a look at some of these numbers that actually if I want to do a, a simulation around an airplane using the large eddy simulation, the computational resources will be available only in the next 30 years. So it's excessively uh, CPU intensive uh, as far as large eddy simulation is concerned. So we can't really do it for real industrial problems. We have to live with um, the cheaper substitutes. So one of the cheaper substitute is the hybrid LES model in which we switch between the RANS model in near the wall and the LES model in the free stream. This is one of the very good substitute to the complete LES model because LES is not able to predict very well near the walls. So near the walls, I can use the RANS based approach and away from the walls, I can use the large eddy simulations. So this is um, a very nice um, approach by which we can uh, solve the limitations of LES and at the same time also use the advantages of LES away from the wall regions. What has come up recently into ANSYS Fluent 13 is called the SAS or the scale adaptive simulations which offers a much cheaper substitute to the full LES model. So what uh, it does is it's actually it's an improvement of the unsteady RANS model. It only produces large scale unsteadiness um, uh, as far as URANS is concerned, but wherever it sees that it needs to deal with the scales in a dynamic way, so it adjusts itself and uh, it allows basically the development of the turbulent spectrum in the detached regions um, as per the, um, the RANS approach. 
but uh, um, overall it gives you a alias like behavior in the unsteady region so wherever it sees that there is an unsteady region there it will uh, give you a behavior similar to an alias model simulation basically it is based on the introduction of a von Kármán uh, length scale into the turbulence uh, scale equations uh, the standard um, k omega sst equations and uh, it still offers the capabilities that RANS has to offer. It was already available in CFX and it has recently been included also into the 13 release of ANSYS Fluent. So the recent advances in turbulence modeling are, are have been especially in the transitional flow modeling um, uh, capabilities in ANSYS Fluent as well as ANSYS CFX. So around the year 2000, uh, the middle of 2005, uh, some sometime around that time, uh, Florian Mentor, Dr. Florian Mentor and uh, Dr. Robin Langtree from the ANSYS CFX um, uh, Research uh, Center in Ottofing, they came up with this transitional flow modeling which was based on correlations and additional transport equations which are there which can predict the, uh, the transition from the lamina to the turbulent flow regime. This is quite helpful. And uh, in addition to this, um, in ANSYS Fluent 13, they have included something called the embedded LES in which it primarily solves RANS, but you can specify an area where it wants to, it has to solve the large eddy simulation. So this is again a very important feature where you can restrict the, the calculation of the large eddy simulation in specific areas as defined by the users. And the int at the interface of the LES and RANS um, um, models being applied in different fluid zones, at the interface some vortex averaging is done and that's where the blending occurs the data is transferred from one model to the other. And uh, as I mentioned about the scale adaptive simulation called the SAS, SST or SAS simply, it's a much cheaper substitute to LES, especially for giving the LES kind of behavior for fluid structure interactions for predicting the unsteady forces. Just to summarize, uh, turbulence, it uh, does pose a great challenge to um, model the general flow physics accurately and uh, uh, modeling is the only alternative we can't really go with direct numerical simulations and a uh, lot of best practices are coming up for specific domains of the problems like uh, turbo machinery specific domains like process industries or fluid structure interaction people are coming up with more and more best practices for them which turbulence model is to be used what are the appropriate inputs for them and um, this is something which we learn through experience uh, and the CFD products offer a wide variety of turbulence modeling uh, capabilities and uh, I think this is just going to get added more and more to accurately and efficiently quickly predict uh, the turbulence phenomena. So uh, I hope this uh, exhaustive lecture was uh, quite uh, knowledgeable for you that you could um, get more prepared to deal with turbulence modeling when you're dealing with the solvers. It is a very great challenging field and it's a field of constant research still. I'm very thankful for your attention to this lecture and uh, I hope the coming lectures will also follow it up that you can see how these turbulence models can be included within uh, the ANSYS Fluent GUI and how you can do a appropriate modeling uh, for your simulation purposes. Thank you very much for your attention again.